So in this video, we're going to take a look at our two sample hypothesis tests, and we're going to just be going through a bunch of examples. Now, as we saw when we went through our two sample hypothesis tests, we had the few examples for each one built in. Here, we're going to have at least one more example for each type. But what I want to do first, though, is kind of go through our flow chart, kind of the way that you should approach these problems, the way that you should kind of look at them in order to be able to figure out, or at least to be able to assist you in figuring out what do I use in which setting? And really keep in mind that really most of this starts to take effect in step three of our hypothesis test. So let's jump over. Let's take a look at that. And again, let's do so by starting off with our flow chart. So one of the first things that we need to figure out when we begin to approach a question is we need to first determine, okay, are we dealing with a one sample? or a two sample question. And, and this is an important distinction, right? Keep in mind, we may have a question that actually has information about two samples being provided to us, but then the actual question what we're interested in is only honing in on the one sample. And so really what you need to look at for the language and the question itself is the language saying, hey, do we have evidence that this guy is different than that guy? Or are we saying, hey, do we have evidence that this is different than 50? Is this different than 0.5, right? Is it something along those lines? If it's, hey, is this value different than that value? Well, we're looking at two sample. Is, hey, this different than some number? Well, then likely we're in our one sample world. So first kind of starting point there. Once we have that narrowed down, let's go take a look at our one sample to start off. With our one sample, we have, first of all, we need to figure out our population proportion that we're looking at. And our two options for our population proportions is, are we asking a question about proportion? Sorry, I was saying question about what population proportion, what population parameter are we interested in? That is, are we asking a question about the population proportion P, or are we asking a question about the population proportion mu, right? Depending on this, we have to work out out from the question. If we're talking about mu, typically you're going to have either raw data, you're going to have either a standard deviation or the ability to calculate a standard deviation. You're going to have something to do with averages. A is the average income, X, Y, Z, and then working through there. Keeping in mind for mu, what we're dealing with typically is we're dealing, well not typically, you are going to be dealing with interval or higher level data. So interval data, ratio data. You will not be dealing with nominal, you will not be dealing with ordinal level data. For proportions, well proportions now we could be dealing with nominal or ordinal level data. Right, we could be working out the proportion of blue sky days. Whether or not a day is blue sky or not, that is nominal. Hey, it is blue sky, great, yes, one in that case, if not, zero, right? So in this case here, nominal or ordinal can pop up for our proportions. Keep in mind, proportions altogether are nominal or higher, mean is interval or higher. Okay, so say we've narrowed it down and we're dealing with our population proportion. From here, well, we need to make sure that we can say that our p bar is normally distributed and then that's going to be centered around p with a standard deviation of p1 minus p all over n and it's going to be normally distributed if np and 1 minus p are jointly greater than or equal to 5. If this holds, well, then we can say yes, and all of our other binomial conditions, that is success, failure, they're mutually exclusive, subsequent events are independent from each other, np and 1 minus p are greater than 5, then great, we can say that p bar will be normally distributed as such. In this case here, well, we can then create, or utilize rather, our following test statistic, such that we can say z is equal to p bar minus p all over the square root of p1 minus p n. And so we have our first kind of arm of our flowchart. 
our next arm is going to be mu. And for mu, what we need to determine before we can even get into this bit is we need to determine, do we know what our standard deviation is? That is, do we have a population standard deviation sigma? Or is it unknown, we just have raw data or just information from our sample such that we have to estimate with the sample standard deviation? Depending on which one we end up utilizing, it is going to determine whether or not we can standardize to a Z or whether or not we can standardize to a T. Before we can go through our standardization, we have to go through our whole bit of ensuring that we can appeal to the central limit theorem. And that is we have to have sample size greater than 3, greater than 10, or greater than 30. Keeping in mind, greater than 3 if x is distributed normally, greater than 10 if x is symmetric, and then finally, greater than 30 if x is completely distributed in some unknown distribution. So x could be anything for its distribution if we have a sample size greater than or equal to 30. From here, from here, if we're good to make these assumptions, if we're good to carry on with our central limit theorem, we have if sigma, we'll be utilizing z, which is x bar minus mu all over standard deviation of x root n. If we don't know what the standard deviation is and we have to estimate it using our sample standard deviation, well then in that case there, we're no longer z distributed, but we are t n minus one, such that x bar minus mu all over the sample standard deviation all over root n. And keep in mind, in this case here, you might have just raw data. You might have to calculate your value of x bar. You might have to calculate your value of our sample standard deviation from the raw data. So you need to go back, you need to recall, what is my formula to calculate the mean? What is my formula to calculate my sample standard deviation? And be able to work through those as well. Okay, so from the one sample side, these are our three possible situations. Figuring out our population parameter, figuring out, hey, can I assume normality or T distribution based off of our assumptions there? And then whether we know sigma or S, either do we go to a T or do we go to a Z? So our one sample world. What about two sample? Well, if we have two sample, well, let's start off again by presuming we can get our population parameter as P. So that is, we have some kind of question about a proportion. Well, if we have some kind of question about a proportion, we can very similarly have that same kind of ideal over here. So we can say if P, uh, NP, N1 minus P, and I should go I, right, because we'll have two different P's. So we need both of these guys to be greater than or equal to 5. And all of our other binomial conditions are met. Well, then, delta P bar will be normally distributed, giving us Z, right, so Z normally distributed, standard normal distribution, delta P bar minus delta P all over. We'll have our square root of cumulative proportion 1 minus that cumulative proportion 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. Keep in mind what is that cumulative proportion? Cumulative proportion we need to work that out that is x1 plus x2 all over n1 plus n2. So in this case here, if we can work out, hey, we're asking some question about proportions, and we can appeal, right? We can say, hey, NP, N1 minus P are both greater than 5, and that's for both proportions in that population we're looking at. Then we can flow through, and we can say, okay, Z distribution, this would be our test statistic, and then go from there. Right? Keep in mind our other big assumptions. 
is that P1 and P2 would be independent. That is the outcome in this proportion is no influence on the outcome on the other. That is the samples, the sample proportions we pull out in each case are independent from each other. They have no influence on one another. And then our standard binomial, mutually exclusive. One event is independent from the next event, on and on and on. So same kind of scenarios here for our proportions. Next, next we have... Let's just kind of scroll over to the right a little bit. We'll, uh, when we've done this, we'll zoom out, view the whole thing together. Next possibility is, let's go all the way out here. Our next possibility is that we're asking about mu. And right in this case here, something about mu1 and mu2 were two samples. So hey, is this mean different than that mean? Is this mean greater than that mean? What are we asking? Something about two different population means. Well, again, what we can do is we can first go and we want to figure out, can we appeal to the central limit theorem for each one? So central limit theorem, same as this case here, right? We need to have, hey, is n for both of these samples greater than 3, 10, or 30? depending on our assumptions about the population distribution. From here, and I'm doing it a little bit different order, these can kind of be switched exchangeable. We have, uh, let's start off with our assumption through this, we have these two, we're talking about the central limit theorem, and then we're also presuming that we have independent samples. Well, if this is the case and we have independent samples, we then have either case one where sigma is known and that sigma one is known and sigma, uh, maybe putting it up top isn't right, sigma x2, sigma x1, there we go. Both of those are known. And if that's the case there, if they're both known, we are going to have a z distribution such that delta x bar minus delta mu is equal to the square root of the variance of 1 all over n1 plus the variance of 2 all over n2. And this is the big thing here, right? This is the variance of 1. Often I see this getting put in as a standard deviation because we're so used to using Standard deviation, standard deviations. But no, 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 this is variance of 1 over n1. Variance of 2 over n2. And so we'd have our test statistic in that scenario. Next case, next case, let's go and say independent samples. Independent samples, but in this case here, our sigma is unknown. So that is, we have s of x1 s of x2 and then with this we make the assumption that even though it's unknown sigma x1 equals sigma x2 so that is we don't know what the population standard deviations are we have to estimate them but we're going to assume that even though we're estimating these and they may be different due to sampling error we're assuming they're coming from populations with identical standard deviations. If that's the case, we standardize. Let's make some room over here. To a t, n1 plus n2 minus 2. And that works out to be delta x bar minus delta mu all over our pooled variance times 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. And then let's finish that up. Let's add on to the bottom. Hey, what's our pooled variance? Well, we can calculate our pooled variance. So s squared pool. That's going to be degrees of freedom from the first. So n1, I always do that. n1 minus 1 times the variance from the first plus n2 minus 1 times the variance from the second 
all over my total new degrees of freedom, n1 plus n2 minus 2. So I have my test statistic in the case of for step 3 when I have question about population means, central limit theorem can be met, independent samples, population standard deviations are unknown but assumed equal. So a bit of a flow to get through that guy then. The last case, the last case, let's jump over to, wait, we haven't used this color yet, red. So in this case here, we'll jump off from central limit theorem before we get to our independent samples. And in this case here, we have dependent samples. That is the outcome in sample one, the outcome in sample two are dependent on one another. That is they're linked to some other external factor. They're linked to each other before and after paired observations. Those are, that's the typical language you're gonna see in these cases. If that's the case, if we have these dependent samples, what we're gonna do is we're gonna create our own new variable. And this new variable we're gonna create is delta. And delta will be t distributed, tn minus 1. And that's going to be delta bar minus mu delta all over my sample standard deviation root n. And the way we're going to create delta is it will be x1 minus x2, right? Or however we phrase this up in our null and hypothesis for the relationship between mu1 and mu2, right? If we work this out as, hey, what mu1 minus mu2 equals zero, well then yeah, we'll do deltas x1 minus x2. If we phrase this guy differently, well then we'd phrase this guy differently as well. That is essentially, if we keep in mind, if we take a look at this, if we have dependent samples, essentially what we're doing is we're just creating a new variable and we're creating a one sample hypothesis test. That is, if we take a zoom out and we take a look at all of these guys together, essentially what we have is this case here and this case working out the exact same. The only difference is, well, what we're testing. We're testing x bar versus we're testing a new created variable delta, which we've worked out based off of the dependent samples. So we have our flow chart that we kind of want to keep in mind as we work through this. And again, big starting off point, are we dealing with a one or two sample hypothesis test? Okay, a lot going on there. Let's go now. Let's take a look at our first question and we'll work through questions from here on out. Okay, as with all of our cases, I strongly recommend you take a look at this, you attempt to read through it yourself, you pause them before I start to approach the question, attempt to work through it the best that you can on your own. If you get stuck, then unpause, see the flow through, see if you get a result the same as mine. Keep in mind, I am working through these on the spot. I really do my best to make sure I'm not making errors. I've gone through these questions a handful of times. I'm pretty sure I know what the response is going to be. Sometimes calculation mistakes do happen as I am doing these just hand, pen and paper with a standard calculator. So once this video is posted and you work through it, if you're completely lost, hey, why is this answer a bit different? Please reach out to me. I might have made a calculation error. It has been known to happen. So just the FYI on that. If these errors happen, I'll update the video and we'll move forward from there. Okay. So as of summer 2018, Rasmussen reports that Trump has an approval rating of 47% from a sample of 1,500 people. The Economist reports that Trump has an approval rating of 41% from a sample of 1,246 people. Okay, so that first bit, that's just a bunch of information. First bullet point, this is actually our question. Based off the Rasmussen report, at the 5% level, can we conclude that Trump does not have majority support? Okay, 
So just that first bullet point. Let's work through our five steps of hypothesis testing. So getting into step one, getting into step one here, stating our null and our alternative. In this case, we need to figure out, are we dealing with a one sample or a two sample situation? And here, all we're saying is based off the Rasmussen report, so we're just saying look at the one report, at the 5% level, can we conclude that Trump does not have majority support? So in this case here, we are looking at a proportion, and let's, let's back up, let's actually go null alternative, let's actually explicitly state these. We're looking at a proportion in each case, and we're asking about majority support, so that's 50% support. And we're saying, hey, can we conclude that Trump does not have majority support? So what we're looking at for our alternative is, in fact, the proportion less than 50%, my null then being that, in fact, it is greater than or equal to 50%. Okay, so null alternative set. Next. I want to go to my significance level, pull that from the question. I'm going to have a significance level of 5%. Three, what's my test statistic? Well, we can go through our low chart and obtain our test statistic in this case. And what we get for our test statistic is that Z equals P bar minus P all over the square root of P1 minus P. So we have our test statistic explicitly stated. Carrying on, step four, let's explicitly state our decision rule. So for explicitly stating our decision rule, we have P bar. Uh, we're going to have a sample size of 1246. Oh, sorry, the Rasmussen report a sample size of 1500. Uh, we have a P of 50%, P bar of 47%. Yeah, that's going to be greater than 5 for both NP and N1 minus P. So I'm good in this case here to say that I'm normally distributed centered around that true population proportion. Carrying down, we're going to standardize this to a Z. So we standardize to a Z, and we want to determine our rejection regions. So for our rejection regions, we go to our alternative, and we're looking for proof that the proportion is less than 50%. So I'm looking for a rejection region over in the left-hand tail here. I want this red area such that that total red area is 5%. So that total red area is 5%. I can go to the table. I can look up based off of that. I can say, okay, that's 5%. This guy here, this is 45%. Looking at my value, I'm going to get a Z statistic of negative 1.645. So to explicitly state my decision rule, I would say that if I calculate some Z, right, my test statistic, less than my critical value, I will reject my null. Very similarly, I could express this in terms of a p-value, and I could say, hey, if I get some p-value less than my significance level, so 0 0.05, I will very similarly reject my null. Okay. So steps one through four, done before us. Now we finally get to go to the question. Now we finally really get to start doing some math. So let's go take a look. Step five, we take our statistic from step three and we go to calculate it. So what are we doing in this case here? Well, we have an observed value of P bar from the Rasmussen of 0.47. We have a sample size of 1500. And we, from our null, believe our true population proportion to be 50%. Or at least that's what we want to test against. Okay. From here, that's everything we need. P bar, P, 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 N. There we go. Everything we need. Let's put them in and calculate. So Z is going to be 
0.47 minus 0.5 all over. Scroll down a bit so we can actually see where we're working. 0.47 minus 0.5 all over. Uh, 0 0.5, 1 minus 0 0.5 all over a sample size of 1500. In the top, I get negative 0 0.03. In the denominator, I get 0.5 times 0.5 divided by 1500. All of that, take the square root of it, 0 0.0, uh, we'll go 129. So 0 0.03 divided by 0 0.0129 gives me negative 2.32. Uh, so 2.32, if we were to take a look at where this guy falls with respect, that's smaller than negative 1.645. That'll be somewhere out there. So we can say, therefore, we have this as evidence to reject our null. And we have evidence to reject our null at the 5% level. Okay, so that was just the first bullet point. We see with that first bullet point that we would reject that he has majority support based off of that poll. But what we want to take a look at next is this next bullet point, which is saying, hey, at the 10% level, do these two reports offer different approval ratings? Right, that is if we take a look at it, Rasmussen report said 47%, The Economist said 41%. So let's take a look at how we would, let's take a look at how we would test that. Let's clean up and then reapproach this question. Okay, so in this case, we're saying test at the 10% level whether or not these two reports offer different approval ratings. So big thing in this, I'm not saying, hey, test if this is different than some number. I'm just saying, hey, test if these two offer different population parameters. So as I go back to step one, in this case, for my null and for my alternative, I'm now saying something like, hey, P. Rasmussen versus P. Economist. And in this case here, what am I asking? I'm just saying, do they offer different? So that is my null would be that they are actually the same. My alternative is saying, no, they in fact are different population parameters. Step two is my significance level and I'll set my significance level at the 10% level based off the question here. Three, three, I wanna state my test statistic. So to calculate my test statistic, or not calculate, but to state it, I have two sample. I'm dealing with a proportion for each of them. N, P, N1 minus P is going to be greater than 5 with these large sample sizes and a proportion close to 50%. That's easily going to be true. So I'm going to get delta P bar minus delta P all over. Cumulative proportion, 1 minus our cumulative proportion, 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. What I can also throw in here just to remind myself is how exactly I calculate that cumulative proportion. And cumulative proportion is x1 plus x2 all over n1 plus n2. So I have that for me as well just so that when I get to step five, I can look back to this and have all the information I need. Step four, let's formulate our decision rule. So in this case here, we've already looked at it, NP and one minus P are greater than five in each case. So given that, I would have delta P bar being normally distributed, centered around what I believe this true delta P to be. And then I need to standardize this to be delta P. Sorry. Standardize this to a Z. Okay. 
So based off of that, what I need to do is I'm going to go back to step one in order to figure out what's going on with the tails. Step two to figure out what I'm putting in the rejection area. In this case here, okay, I'm just having a two sample. I'm just saying Rasmussen is not equal to the economist. Typically what we need to do is we need to retransform this and retransform it to be not just, hey, this guy not equal to that guy, but some algebraic manipulation, that one minus the other one, and then respect to zero. So in this case here, let's go and let's say that we're going to be dealing with Rasmussen minus the economist does not equal zero versus Rasmussen minus the economist equals zero. So that is when I'm working out delta P bar, delta P, it is the proportion from Rasmussen minus the proportion from the economist. Okay. What do I have? Significance level of 10%. All I'm saying is not equal to, so I'm putting that rejection area in both tails. I'm not having a statement of direction. That is, I'm not saying, hey, I believe Rasmussen is higher. I'm not saying I believe Rasmussen is lower. I'm just saying they're not the same. So 10% split between two tails. That gives me 5% there. That gives me 5% there. That is, as we go look up our table, 45% in the middle. 45% in the middle is going to be negative 1.645 and positive 1.645. So to state this explicitly, if I get some test statistic and the absolute value of that test statistic is greater than 1.645, we will reject our null. Again, we could state this with respect to a p-value. We could state if our p-value is less than our significance level, so less than 10%, we will similarly reject our null. So two different ways that we can state this. Keep in mind, if we were to calculate a p-value for this question, two-tailed test, that probability we calculate times two. So two-tail test times two. Okay, final step, step five. Let's go and actually calculate what's happening here. So step five, we go back to step three. We pull this forward and we calculate our Z value. So first bit, we want to take a look at delta P bar. So again, how are we doing delta P bar? We're doing Rasmussen minus the economist. So Rasmussen minus the economist is 47 minus 41. So 0.47 minus 0.41 gives me a delta P bar of 0 0.06 minus delta P. Well, that's what my null is. My null is saying that, hey, delta P is actually zero. So there we go. We're then going to take that. We're going to go and divide that by our cumulative proportion, 1 over n1, 1 over n2. Oh, but we don't know our cumulative proportion yet. We need to calculate that. This appears to be problematic. We know Rasmussen to be 0.47. We know the economist to be 0 0.41. But we don't know what x is for each one. But what we do know is we do know what the R is. Right? We, sorry, R. We do know what the N is. We know what the sample size is for each of these. We know that the Rasmussen report had a sample of 1,500. And we know that the Economist report had a sample of 1,246. Okay. Given that, let's just keep scrolling down, keep making room as we go lower. Given that, we know that P bar, sorry, these guys are P bar. We know that P bar is X over N. So hey, if we know P bar and we know N, we can solve for the unknown X. So that is for the Rasmussen report, we can say, okay, 0.47 equals X over 1500 or 0.47 times 1500 gives us 
705 as X Rasmussen. We do the same thing for the economist. We could say, okay, 0 0.41 equals X over 1246. So 0.41 times 1246 yields for me 510.86 equals X. And here's here's where easily we're also like, what what's going on? How do we get 510.86? Where do we get this 86 of a person from? Right? If we're looking at proportions, just how many said yes they support versus the total population? Well, likely what happened is that this reporting of 0.41 isn't exact. Likely it's a rounded, right? So likely what happened is they're just like, well, we're just going to report this to two decimal places. That is, if we actually had 511, right, if you work this out, if we had 511 in support, 511 all over 1246 equals 0 0.41011, right? So yes, in this case, we would typically drop that. We would just round to 0 0.41, but that gives us this funny kind of feature here where we're saying, hey, we get this funny amount. In order just for consistency for this course, typically I would tend just to round up round to the nearest value based off of the rounding that happened here but for consistency here in this course what i'm going to say is just use the value of x that we've calculated so that is if we have 51086 we'll use 51086 so to get our cumulative proportion then we have 705 plus 51086 all over 1500 plus 1246. So what does that give us? 705 plus 51086 gives me 121586 all over 1500 plus 1246, 2746. So we get 121586 divided by 2746, and we get 0 0.44, I uh, will go one more decimal place, 3. So I get my cumulative proportion, that guy there, cumulative proportion to be 0.443. So to go back up, now that we have that, let's work out what our standard errors are. We're going to have 0 0.443, 1 minus 0 0.443, 1 over 1500 plus 1 over 1246. So in the numerator, we get 0 0.06. In the denominator, we get 0.443 times 1 minus 0.443. That's going to give us uh, 0 0.2468. Oh, let's make that a little bit more legible. 2468 times, what's this guy? We have 1 over 1500 plus 1 over 1246. That's going to be 0 0.001469. Okay, let's multiply those two together. So that guy there times 0.2468 gives me all together Z of 0 0.06 over 0 0.0003. Six. Final step. All right, kind of jump that there. We still have our square root to keep in mind. Take the square root of all that. So z equals 0 0.06 all over 0 0.019. Okay, quite a few steps. 
Finally, we get our Z score 0.06 divided by 0.019 gives me a Z score of 3.15. Long winded, we finally got there. Well, let's go and interpret that result. We're looking at a Z with respect to 1.645. We just got a Z of 3.15. So we are clearly way out in that rejection region. So we could say very clearly, therefore, we have evidence to reject our null. And we have our solution there. Okay. A lot of steps involved with these guys, right? We have to get our cumulative proportion. We have this big amount of garbly goop in the bottom to work through. Don't do like what I did there. I truthfully almost forgot that radical. That is a common mistake I end up seeing. Before you calculate that your final amount, always go and take a look back. Did I actually include that radical? You're doing so much calculation on the bottom here, it's often forgotten. So make sure that you take that quick look. Did you remember your radical sign? And then working through getting our final Z value. Okay. Well, let's go jump on. Let's go take a look at our next question. So here we have four randomly selected statistic students from a normal population. They were given a 15 question multiple choice and 15 open ended questions all on the same material. The professor was interested in determining if students scored higher on the open ended questions. Each mark is out of 15. The results are as follows. We want to know, did the students score higher on the short answer questions? We want to test this at the 5% significance level. Okay. First thing we need to work out, what are we looking at? One sample or two samples? Well, what we're looking at in this case here, did they score higher on the short answer, the open-ended, than they did the multiple choice? So that is, I'm asking, is short answer higher than multiple choice? So two sample is really what we have going on here. What we're then looking at is what is our population parameter? Are we dealing with a proportion or are we dealing with an average? Well, in this case here, typically, right, you kind of have to think about this one. I've seen this question being asked and I've seen students respond with this saying, oh, each mark is out of 15. So, hey, this is a proportion, 10 out of 15 correct, 11 out of 15 correct, 8 out of 15 correct. Okay, but then what are you doing with all these proportions in the end, right? That's a lot of proportions. I'm not sure what you're doing. What we're working on in this case here is we're working on the average. We're working out what is the average score on the multiple choice. We're working out what is the average score on the short answer. And we're working out, hey, is that average score on the short answer, in fact, higher than the average multiple choice? That makes a lot more sense to work through this. On average, did they perform better on the short answer than the multiple choice? So that is, as we phrase our null, as we phrase our alternative, what do we have here? Well, we're dealing with average and we'll have multiple choice. Average, I'll go short answer. Multiple choice, short answer. And what we're saying is determining if students scored higher on the open-ended, that is the short answer question. So is the average of the short answer higher? And then the opposite being the case there. Keeping in mind, we'll want to rephrase this. We'll want to work through it in a bit of a different way. We'll want to work out such that, hey, is it the case such that zero is less than our short answer minus our multiple choice versus the fact that zero is actually greater than the short answer minus the multiple choice. Now, the order that you did that is entirely entirely subjective. We could have done that the opposite way and just been fine, right? Either way, either direction would have been just fine to work through this. We just need to pick one and stick through it for consistency as we work through the entire question. Step two, what's our significance level? Well, let's test at the 5%. So we're going to set alpha 
at 5%. Step three, what is our test statistic? Well, okay, in this question here, I'm looking at it and it's screaming at me that I don't know what my standard deviation is. There is nothing given here about a standard deviation. So right from that, I can tell that I'm dealing with a T. What I need to work out is I have two samples. I need to work out whether or not this is a two independent samples or two dependent samples. And in this case here, what I really need to say, what I need to do to look at this is say, hey, for student A, is the result on the multiple choice going to be influencing the result of their short answer? That is, does the result on the multiple choice contain information as to how well they're likely to do here? Keep in mind, we said, hey, it was all the same material. Same material, multiple choice, same material, short answer. You could think quite readily that, hey, if a student did well on the multiple choice, they're likely also going to do well on the short answer. If a student did poorly on the multiple choice, they're likely also going to do poorly on the short answer. So in that case there, if there's information in the one sample that tells us information about the second, these are dependent samples. So in this case here, these are paired to the student. This outcome and this outcome are both linked to this student. These are paired observations. This is a dependent, a two, sam a two sample test such that our samples are dependent on one another. So in this case here, we would have a T n minus one of delta bar minus mu delta all over the standard deviation of delta root n. So yes, I have a two sample hypothesis test. I'm going to create this new variable delta, which I will collapse to be a one sample hypothesis test. Step four. Okay. And step four, what are we doing here? We're explicitly stating our decision. So I'm going to have a T distribution, right? And what? I only have four. How can I appeal to the central limit theorem? Well, I've said up here that, hey, I've selected four random students from a normal population. So that is, I only needed a sample size of three to appeal. So I'm good. I'm good. And then looking at delta which is going to be centered around zero. And I'm going to standardize that to a T. Now, okay, this is where you know how many degrees of freedom do I have a T what? Well, this new variable I create delta is just going to be X short answer minus X multiple choice. So I'll have one value, two value, three value, four values. I'll have four values of my T. So this will be a T. So for T3, I didn't work out what my critical value is. So again, to find my rejection region, I want to go back to my null and alternative. And in this case here, I have this bit saying, hey, I believe that these guys, this difference, not there, that is mu delta. I believe that in fact, this difference is greater than zero. That's what I want to test. So greater than zero is going to put me over here on the right hand side meaning I'll be putting my rejection area just in the right-hand tail because I have this statement of direction. Based off of this then, what area do I put in that rejection? Well, I go back to my alpha, my significance level, and I'm going to set an alpha of 5%. So now we need to go to our T table. We need to go to our T table. We need to look up what the corresponding critical value is, the corresponding T statistic for an alpha of 5% for three degrees of freedom. So going and looking that up, I get a T statistic, a critical value of 2.353. Okay. So from here, I can now explicitly state my decision rule. I can say if I calculate some T3 in step five, which is greater than 2.353, I will take that as evidence to reject my null.
Alternatively, if you wanted to, you could also calculate the p-value. Keep in mind, for the t, you would have to use Excel or R or some kind of stats program in order to calculate your p-value accurately. And in this case here, we would say if our p-value is less than our significance level, 0 0.05, we would reject the null. So we have our explicit statement of our decision rule. Step five then, step five, let's actually decide what's going on. And to do so, we'll take step three and we'll actually calculate it. We'll notice what we need to do in order to do so is we need to calculate what delta is. So let's start off by calculating delta. And we've said delta is short answer minus multiple choice. So if we go and take a look at that, short answer minus multiple choice, 11 minus 10 gives me one. 11 minus 11 is 0. 9 minus 8, 1. And then 6 minus 7, that is negative 1. So if I go through to work this out now, I can calculate my sample mean, delta bar, as the summation of all this. So it's going to be 1, 2, minus 1 is 1. Uh, 1 divided by 4. I'm going to get delta bar equals 0 0.25. So 0.25 is delta bar. I need to find out what my standard deviation is. So keep in mind, standard deviation of delta. Essentially, I'm just going to replace everything that would have normally been an x with the d. And so I get the summation of d minus delta bar squared all over n minus one. So what I need to work out, I need to work out, hey, what is delta minus delta bar squared? So what is one minus 0.25? And then square that. I get 0 0.5625. What's zero minus 0 0.25? And then square that. Well, that's 0, 0.0. 625. Hey, I've already done that one. I know again that's 0 0.5625. And then last one there. Minus 1 minus 0.25. Take the square root of that. And I get 1.5625. Take my sum of squared deviations, right? Sum of squared deviations. So I get 1.5625 plus 0.5625 plus 0.625 plus 0.5625, and I get a sum of squared deviations to be 3.3125. My sample variance then is, right, this is, sorry, our variance, take the square root of it to get our standard deviation, is going to be 3.3125 all over n minus 1, so I have Four in my sample, so I'll divide it by three. And I get a variance of 1.10. I will go a few decimal places for two. Take the square root of that to get my standard deviation. And square root of that guy gives me 1.051. Just to carry around an actual decimal, an extra decimal place there. Okay. So I have delta, I have mu from, hey, I'm presuming it's equal to zero. I have my standard deviation and I have my sample size. I have everything I need to calculate my test statistic. So let's do that now. We're gonna calculate that as our T3 being equal to 0 0.25 minus zero all over 1.051 square root of 4. So 0 0.25 all over 0 0.5255. And that yields for us a t-statistic of 0 0.5. 
four seven uh four seven six which in this case here, if I wanted to visualize where that is, that's going to be pretty close to right there. Clearly not at all in our rejection region. So we would say, therefore, we fail to reject. Okay. So we have that question. We have our paired dependent samples, t-statistic, two-sample hypothesis test. Let's go jump on, let's take a look at the next guy. As part of a study of corporate employees, the director of HR for PNC Incorporated wants to compare the distance traveled to work by employees at its downtown and midtown offices. A sample of 35 downtown employees showed they travel a mean of 595K per month. A sample of 40 employees uh, sorry, a sample of 40 Midtown employees showed they travel a mean of 610K per month. The population standard deviations for the Downtown and Midtown offices are 48 and 42K respectively. Is there a difference in the mean distance traveled per month between Downtown and Midtown employees? Use the five-step hypothesis testing procedure test at the 10% level. Okay, wordy, wordy question here. But step one, what's our no, what's our alternative? Well, typically, right, this is going to show up pretty near the end of all of that. And I'm saying, hey, is there a difference in the mean distance traveled per month between downtown and midtown employees? So in that case there, I'm saying something about no alternative, something about mu midtown, mu, aha. Uh -huh. New Midtown and New Downtown. All right, that is I'm comparing two different averages, right? Mean distance traveled. So, okay, hey, I've also figured out what my population parameter is in this case here. What am I asking about the two? Well, I'm just saying, is there a difference? I'm not saying, do Midtown employees travel farther? Do Downtown employees travel less? No, no, I'm just saying, is there a difference? So, for my alternative, they're not equal, that is, there is a difference. My no, 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 they're actually the same. Typically, we're gonna to want to re-express this in terms of zero, do some algebra with it. And so, in order to do so, let's go and work out. Mu midtown minus mu downtown does not equal zero versus midtown minus downtown actually does equal zero. Okay, so we have our step one, our statement of our null and alternative set. Step two, what's our significance level? Well, we're gonna test at the 10%. So significance level is 10%. Step three, what is our test statistic? Well, okay, going down in that flow chart, we're in our two sample, we're dealing with the mean. We have central limit theorem being met. We have 40 employees, 35 employees. We don't need any assumptions in this case. Do I know my standard deviations? Well, the population standard deviations are known to be that and that. So, okay, I know my standard deviations, meaning I have Z equal to delta X bar minus delta mu all over variance of one, sample one. Variance of two all over sample size two. So I have my total test statistic here. Step four then. Well, x1 is going to be good. x bar 1 will be normally distributed. x bar 2 will be normally distributed. I can appeal to the central limit theorem for each one individually, meaning my delta x bar will also be normally distributed, centered around delta mu, which I presume is 0. And I standardize these guys to a z in this case. So delta x bar to a z, where is my rejection region? Well, in this case, 
I'm just saying not equal to, I have no statement of direction. It could be smaller, it could be bigger. So two-tailed test. Two-tailed test means I'm gonna put rejection region in each side, such that my total rejection region is 10%. So total rejection region is 10%. That's five. That's five meaning this guy here is 45, that guy there is 45. We go and we look that up in the table, we look up 0.45, we find the corresponding value, and I get negative 1.645 and positive 1.645. So explicitly stating this, if I calculate my test statistic, absolute value of Z, and I find that in magnitude, it's greater than my critical value of 1.645. I will take that as evidence to reject the null. Again, I could phrase it in terms of p-values. I could say if I calculate it and I get a p-value which is smaller than my significance level, I will take that as evidence to reject my null. Keep in mind, two-tailed test, I would times that p-value I calculate by two. So, okay, step five, step five, it's game time. Let's actually calculate what's happening. So I need to work out x bar midtown, x bar downtown, the variance of midtown, variance of downtown, and then I'm also going to need to know the sample size of each one. So sample size, midtown, sample size, downtown. So, okay, all the information I need to pull out of this question or calculate if I have to. So let's take a look here. Um, jumping through a sample of 35 downtown, okay. 35 downtown showed that downtown traveled a mean of 595. Okay, a sample of 40 Midtown. Okay, 40 Midtown showed that they traveled a mean of 610. Perfect. The population center deviations for downtown and Midtown are 48 and 42 respectively. Okay, so downtown is 48 and Midtown is 42. Okay, perfect. I have everything. Well, let's go, let's go calculate. So, Z is, what am I doing? I'm doing midtown minus downtown. So midtown minus downtown is going to be 610 minus 595. My delta X bar is 15 minus delta mu. My null is that they're the same, so zero. All over. Ah, see, I fell into this trap, made this mistake. I said, I wrote down here, I said I wanted my variance of Midtown and I wrote it and I wrote down 42. What do I have in my question here? The population standard deviations are 48 and 42. That is, these aren't my variances, those are my standard deviations. So let's just update this, let's just get rid of this squared and I'll square them down here in calculation. So 42 squared, gives me 1764 all over sample size of Midtown 40. Plus 48 squared, 2304 all over 35. Okay, so what does that give us? 1764 all over 40 plus 2304 all over 35. Take the square root of that and we're dividing by 10 point, I will go 48, 485. So 15 divided by 10.485 gives us a 1.43 as our test statistic. And comparing that, what do we conclude? Well, 1.43 is smaller than 1.645. So 
Therefore, I fail to reject the null. If we wanted to visualize that, 1.43, that's something like that, right? 1.43. That's not in my rejection area, so therefore I fail to reject. If I fail to reject, essentially we're saying, no, we do not have evidence for the alternative. So, yeah, perhaps the null is actually true. Perhaps, right? We're not saying the null is true. We're just saying we don't have enough evidence to reject the null. That's all we're saying. So in that case there, our evidence suggests that in fact, they both travel the same. Okay, let's take a look at our next question here. So let's take a look at this guy here. So it's often useful for companies to know who their customers are and how they became customers. So a newly opened restaurant in Victoria is interested in whether a customer just walked in or was actually referred to the business by a friend. The restaurant obtained the following sample information for the two groups. So here we have the source, whether they were walked in or referred. We have the average as to how much they spent, the standard deviation as to how much they spent, and the sample size for each one. We want to test at the 5% significance level. Is it reasonable to conclude that the mean amount spent is different for customers that were referred by friends than those who were walked in on their own? We're going to assume that the population standard deviations are equal. Now, okay, what thing that pops out with me in this as well, this is a question that I had just stumbled across that I was like, yeah, this is relevant for us. Um, we have to make another assumption given our sample sizes, right? And this is never actually stated in this. Technically, given this, if these assumptions are invalid, technically we can't move forward to answer this question given the tools that we have. But if we assume that walk-ins, we presume that they are symmetrically distributed, right? Because they have a sample size of at least 10. And if we presume that people who are referred are normally distributed, then we can go about answering this question. If we don't have these statements, we actually don't have enough information to be able to appeal to the central limit theorem, Technically, we cannot be sure of normalcy. If we cannot be sure of normalcy or that it's even distributed based off the student T, we're stuck, we're done, we can't carry on. So we're gonna make those two assumptions just for us to be able to work through this question. So just kind of another thing that popped in as I was reading that. So going through, of course, we have our five steps of hypothesis testing. So let's start off with step one. Step one is, what's our no, what's our alternative? So, okay, first of all, are we dealing with a one sample or two sample? Well, okay, going back to my question here, what am I actually asking? Well, I'm saying, is it reasonable to conclude that the mean amount spent is different for customers that were referred than those who walked in on their own? So I'm asking, is there a difference between the two groups? So null. Alternative, I'm saying, hey, is mu1 any different than mu2? So my null would be that they're equal to each other, the alternative being that they're not equal to each other, that they're in fact different. Uh, to rephrase that, let's say that we're going to have uh, mu1 minus mu2 equals zero. And then, of course, the opposite, mu1 minus mu2 does not equal zero. And we'll say, uh, we'll say what? That referred is one. So let's put r instead of one. And then I'll try to do a w over top of that, two. So referred minus walk in. That's what I'm doing for step one. Step two, what is my, what is my significance level here? Well, my significance level, I want to test at the 5%. So significance level is 0 0.05. Three, what's my test statistic? Well, okay, what do I have? I have a sample size. I have a standard deviation. What is this standard deviation? This is really the big question. Is this going to be a population or a sample standard deviation? Let's go read back and check. Let's go back one sentence. The restaurant obtained the following sample information for the two groups. So, okay, looking at that, this is all sample information. That is X bar. 
this is my sample standard deviation, and this is my sample size. So, okay, based off of that, my standard deviation, sigma x is unknown. I've used this sample standard deviation. So that tells me, that tells me I'm dealing with a t. From here, are these dependent or independent samples? Well, in this case here, I would be saying these are independent samples. I don't see how number walked in has any influence or gives any information about how much being spent by those referred, right? If this is, hey, we just surveyed 20 customers in a given day, the walk-ins have no impact on my referrals. So I would take these as independent. If that's independent, this is gonna be N1 plus N2 minus two. And then that is delta x bar minus delta mu all over the pooled variance, one over n1 plus one over n2. Again, I always typically like to write out these additional things such as the pooled, just so that I have it to refer to later. And in this case here, pooled variance is degrees of freedom from the first one. So N1, I always do that. N1 minus one times the variance of one plus degrees of freedom from the second one. So N2 minus one degrees of freedom from the second one all over my total degrees of freedom. N1 plus N2 minus two. Okay, step four. Explicitly state our decision rule. So if we make these assumptions that walk-ins are symmetrically distributed at least, and that referrals are normally distributed at least, then our sample size are large enough. If we cannot make those assumptions, technically we cannot assume normality, and we cannot say that delta x bar looks like that. Technically, we are done. We could not carry on beyond one and two. We, this would not be the correct test statistic if we could not presume these distributions. So just a heads up for that. What do we have? We need to know our degrees of freedom. So we have a 12 plus eight is a 20, 20 minus two. We're looking at a T18 here. And we are looking for, going back to my null and alternative, my step one, I'm just saying not equal to. So not equal to means it's a two tail test. So I have a rejection area in each tail and I'm testing at the 5%. So testing at the 5% level, that's 2.5% there. That is 2.5% there. To go and work that out, we need to go to our table. We need to look up an alpha of 2.5% for 18 degrees of freedom. And what we get is we get a critical value of plus and minus 2.101, 2.101. So we can state that explicitly. If the T18 that I end up calculating in step five is greater in magnitude than 2.101, I will use that as evidence to reject my null. Again, I can phrase that if I wanted to calculate the p-value. Keep in mind, you need to use the stat software to calculate that p-value for a t. If my p-value is smaller than my significance level, so less than 5%, I will similarly reject my null. Keeping in mind, two-tailed test. When we calculate this p-value, we're going to have to times by two. Okay. What we wanna work out now, we now wanna work out step five, go back to step three, pull down all of our information and actually calculate what's happening. So in this case, let's start off by calculating our pooled variance. So pooled variance is N1 minus one. So we'll go 12 minus one, that is 11 times the variance of one. So that's gonna be six squared, so 36. 
plus degrees of freedom from number two. So eight minus one is seven times eight squared is 64. All over my new degrees of freedom. So new degrees of freedom were 18. So what do I have? 11 times 36 plus 7 times 64. All of that divided by 18 gives me my pooled variance of 46, 88, 888. 8, 8. So we'll go 88, 9. Round it off there. Okay. From there, uh, let's carry down. I'm going to have X bar preferred, X bar walk in, and that is referred is 44, walk in is 38, and referred, N walk in. Ah, uh, walk in was 12, referred was 8. Okay. So based off of that, let's calculate our actual T statistic. T is delta X bar. Well, for my delta X bar, let's go back and check. I believe it was referred minus walk-in. Mu referred minus mu walk-in. So, okay. Referred minus walk-in. That gives me a delta X bar of 6 minus my presumed difference and my null, 0. All over... Pooled variance, 46, 8, 8, 9, 1 over 8 plus 1 over 12. So in the numerator, I get 6. Oh, that's not a 6. I get 6 all over. Let's work that out. 1 over 12 plus 1 over 8 times by 46.889. We'll take the square root of that answer, giving us 3.125. 6 divided by that gives me 1 point, now we'll go 92. So 1.920, oh, that's actually 9197, but we'll round that. 7 makes the 9 jump, and then there we go. Where does that put us? 1.92, that'll be somewhere around there. That is not in my rejection zone, therefore we will fail to reject. So fail to reject my null. What does that mean, right, to actually get some inference from that? I failed to reject my null. That is, get rid of that alternative. I don't have any evidence to suggest that these are not the same. That is, even though when I look at it, referred looks like I'm getting more from my referred clients, there's actually no statistical evidence to support that. Statistically, these two values are identical. So we can't really infer that our referred clients pay any more. Okay, that does us for our examples. We've worked through at least one of each. We've taken a look at a bunch of different two sample hypothesis tests. We even had the one sample thrown in there. I really want to caution you with that. Make sure when you're reading this, especially when you come to the final, you're not just stuck in this two sample mind and you put everything into a two sample hypothesis test. No, 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 there are one sample tests out there. Keep that in mind. Go back to that flow chart that we started off with, really take a look at that and say, okay, what do we have? Do we have a one sample? Do we have a two sample? What test statistic am I utilizing? And then move forward from there. If you have any questions about this, any questions on any of the examples we worked through or anything we've gone through so far this semester, please feel free to contact me. Reach out through either the D2L Frequently Asked Questions or by email. Thanks.